Good morning. We gather to worship the holy God this morning as the people of hope, the people of eternity, the people of Jesus Christ. I'd like to welcome you all here to worship, especially those who are visitors among us or visitors online. If you are a visitor, we hope you're welcomed well and that you would reach out to us so we can get to know you a little bit better. This morning I have just a few announcements before we go further into worship. One is Pastor Clint is on vacation this Sunday, this, well today, and my good friend Pastor Tom Frazier is going to be bringing us the word today of God, where we look forward to hearing what the Lord has put on your heart. Also, we have uh, our foreign mission partners, the Callisons. They will be coming to town. The church supports them in their work in foreign countries. They'll be coming to visit us on July 14th. You may have been getting that notice. Uh, You may have gotten a text notice about that if you're on our text list. It's also in the newsletter. And the reason I bring that up today is we do want RSVPs for that luncheon when when they're here on the 14th. So if you do plan to come, please either uh, contact the church office or respond back to those texts and let us know that you indeed will be at that luncheon. With that, I ask you to stand if you are able, and we will pray and go further into worship together. Holy God, we thank you for gathering us today as your people, for calling us here into this place to worship you. Thank you for connecting us all through the Holy Spirit as a family, as a a church family, and also connected to Christ through that same Holy Spirit. We pray that the words that we say today, the songs that we offer, the prayers that we lift up, Lord, all of them are inspired by you and all of them bring glory to you. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I have the wrong sheet. (laughs) Call to worship. (laughs) It just said Kristen, and I'm like, Kristen's not up here. (laughs) Sorry, Kristen. Call to worship. Let's let's join together in a call to worship. (laughs) One, great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? Oh, magnify the Lord with me.
As we approach our holy God, it is right that we come to the Lord in confession, confession of sin, recognizing that we do all sin. We turn from God each week, whether through omission or doing acts that take us away from God. But as we talk about in our, our confession this morning, sometimes we just simply fail, or sometimes we just simply go through the motions in our life or in worship, where we turn from God and not glorify him with his holy purpose. So we're going to pray this prayer of confession this morning. I'll give the offer the first part of the prayer, and then we will pray together corporately and then have a time of silent personal confession. So join me in this prayer this morning. Lord, you have called us to worship you. We gladly gather as we praise you, though our own inadequacy reminds us of how we have broken our relationship with you. Because we are sinful people, even our worship fails to be what it could be. We often treat it as a show. We simply go through the motions, failing to recognize that you want to engage us deeply. Renew us, we pray, according to your steadfast love. Remind us of your covenant faithfulness and have mercy on us in the name of Jesus Christ. Now is the time for silent personal confession. Friends, we confess our sin to the Lord, not, of, not out of guilt or shame, but because of the good news of the grace of God who's given us salvation and forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. So know that when you come, and our promise that when we come to the Lord in spirit and in truth and seeking forgiveness, we will find it. So know indeed that this morning we are all forgiven. Amen. And because we are at now peace and reconciled with God, we should also be reconciled with one another through that same peace. So let us share the peace of Christ to each other. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us share with one another a sign of Christ's peace. Peace again. It's a joy to be here this morning upon Pastor Clint's invitation to open God's Word with you. Uh, you're my church family, and it's a, it's a great experience to come together as we are week after week, opening and looking at God's Word for what He would say to us today. This summer, as many of you know, Pastors Clint and Jason are leading us through a series of sermons on the subject of God gathering His church together in corporate worship. We are the ecclesia, or the ecclesia, as I learned it in my seminary Greek class years ago, which means basically called out once. We are the ones whom God has called out from the world to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We're drawing from a book by Matt Merker titled Corporate Worship, and each Sunday's message is drawing attention to various components of what makes our worship most meaningful and dynamic. And the goal, of course, is to help us individually, as well as a local church, to experience the fullness and the richness of God's presence in worship. 
This morning, I'd like us to zero in, really, on where worship actually begins, namely with the acknowledgement that God is God, and He alone is worthy of our praise. By definition, the word worship literally means worthship or ascribing worth or value to something or to someone. As followers of Jesus Christ, everything we do here on Sundays, everything we do during the week should reflect, should demonstrate that worth directly or indirectly. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, "Do, do it all for the glory of God. So there's really nothing that we can do in the course of any day or any week that is more important than worshiping God, and where possible, doing it together as we are today. When you think about about it a little more, you realize that every other ministry in the church is dependent upon the quality of our worship. For example, apart from authentic worship, evangelism and outreach are sales events. Fellowship becomes mere socializing. Social action becomes the mere distribution of goods. Bible study itself is reduced to the explaining the meaning of words without coming to grips with the divine person who speaks those words. And without true worship, the church is really not much different than the Rotary Club. A great preacher and writer by the name of A.W. Tozer years ago once said that worship is the missing jewel of the church. He was right on target then, and he is today. If corporate worship is something that we will spend eternity doing together, what happens right here every Sunday should resemble, at least to some extent, what it will be like in eternity. Do you ever imagine what it's going to be like to worship with people from every tribe and nation for all eternity? That's what we'll be doing most of the time. So you might consider our Sundays as dress rehearsals. We're practicing. We're getting ready for the big event that's going to blow us away, and we can't wait for that to happen. Our problem, though, is that we have a culture that works against what we're trying to do. As you know, we live in a culture of individualism, consumerism, and entitlement. And most damaging is our tendencies to adapt to the culture more than anything else. And so we come to a Sunday service such as this, and we We think like consumers, don't we? We often wonder, at least I'll speak for myself and say, what's in this for me, right? We go through the mechanics of worship, but always in the backs of our minds, we're evaluating. You're evaluating me right now. I can read your mind. No, I really can't. (laughs) You're evaluating the music, the greeters, the prayers, the facilities. You're evaluating how people are dressed and their hairstyles. Oh yes, the sermon too. And our focus isn't on God necessarily, but on the product. And if we make worship a product to evaluate, we're really missing out on the true meaning of worship. In a previous church that I served, we had a printed phrase that appeared on the top of the worship folder each week that said, no shows, no performances, just living worship. That's what we strive for. Back in the late 1990s, a pastor by the name of Mike Pelliarchi began to notice a tendency in his church to focus too much on the performance aspect of music, on the music specifically, and not on Jesus. And he sensed that his worship gatherings were kind of going flat spiritually, and that the congregation was just going through the motions, and worship really wasn't flowing from the heart. And so the pastor made a drastic move. What did he do? He got rid of the sound system for a few services, so that the people gathered together with just their voices. He didn't use the praise team. He challenged the congregation to be participants in worship and not consumers. And he asked the people, when you come through the doors on a Sunday morning, what are you going to bring as your offering to God? And he wasn't talking about money either. Well, as you can imagine, it led to some awkward silence for a while. But eventually, people broke into some offered songs and heartfelt prayers, and they began to encounter God in a fresh way as they sang a cappella. It wasn't long before they reintroduced the musicians and the sound system, but they had gained a whole new perspective about what worship is. His worship leader at that particular time was a guy named Matt Redman. And out of that experience that that church went through, Matt, who has since become a prolific songwriter 
wrote a song, a song that has riveted people in churches all over the world. Listen to the words. You might recognize them. When the music fades away, all is stripped away, and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within. Through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Some of you will remember and know that song. How that song has been used to encourage congregations and people everywhere. But it's all about Jesus. It's not about how well we perform, the praise team, the choir, the organist, pastor. It's a matter of the heart. Because the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Now, in the time that remains, I want us to look at one of the greatest passages in the Bible on the subject of worship. It's in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, and it's chapter 6. I invite you to take a Bible, either your own or, the, or one from the pew in front of you, and turn, please, to Isaiah chapter 6, found on page 685 of the Pew Bible. It's a very graphic passage that I'm sure you're familiar with, but it unpacks the very nature of true worship. How do we discover the missing jewel of worship? Well, Isaiah 6 is really the story of God's call as a prophet, as a spokesman for God to the nation of Israel. Probably took place around 740 B.C. In this call and in this vision, Isaiah sees God on a throne. And it's a powerful experience of worship. Just before I read, let us take a moment to pray. Gracious God, may we see through the eyes of our heart the truth that you have for us today that will penetrate, make a difference in how we think, and most importantly, later, in how we live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to, the, flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. This is a vision unlike any head that Isaiah had ever had before or after. In verse 1, you'll notice he's saying that this vision took place in the year that King Uzziah died. Who was King Uzziah? Not that important right now, but it is important to know that he had served for 52 years. A long time, a very long time for anyone to govern. So the fact that King Uzziah is either dead or he's about to die is a huge crisis. There become, there, there's become a leadership vacuum in the nation. And I'm sure that Isaiah felt that vacuum. But in the midst of the crisis, Isaiah had this experience of worship in which he sees God lifted up on a throne. Uzziah might be gone, but God still reigns. I don't know about you, but I've found occasionally that times of crisis really allow time for meaningful worship. They kind of have a way of stripping all, these, all the other things away. Crises will do that. They'll bring you back to what's most important. I find it interesting that the modern media, which you know, will criticize anyone and everyone for talking about prayer, the first time there's a tragic accident, such as an, a plane crash or a, tra a travesty of that nature, 
prayers are mentioned. People tend to come back to the heart. People know what's really important. Isaiah also makes the point here that an excellent place for worship is the place where God's people normally gather. In this case, it was the temple. In verse 1, he says that he saw the train of his robe fill the temple. In verse 4, he saw, he saw the temple filled with smoke. Two references to the temple, the place where God was known to inhabit. I'm not sure if Isaiah himself was in the temple or if he just had a vision of God uh, enthroned in the temple. We don't know that. But either way, God was seen as the, pla as the place where God's people traditionally came to worship, and it was the temple. I don't want to make too much of this because actually, as you know, we can worship God anywhere we want, at home, at work, at school, on a fishing trip, and even on a golf course, as people like to say. But there's something special, isn't there, about coming to the place, this place, where God's people meet together once a week for congregational worship, a place that's been set aside for worship. Whether it's a beautiful building like this, or a home, or a school, or a storefront, it's a place where God's people gather to praise Him. For the next few moments, I want to highlight three simple truths that this passage teaches us about why we gather and how we can discover or rediscover the missing jewel of worship. First of all, we gather to exalt God's worth. It's pretty obvious in verses 1 through 4 that Isaiah has a laser focus on God. Nothing else shows up at this point. So a valid question for you and me is, what do we tend to focus on when we walk into this sanctuary on Sunday morning? What do we focus on? What did you think about when you sat down this morning? Well, we're looking at scripture that's teaching us this morning. The first thing it teaches me is that we are to focus on God's majesty. We exalt his majesty, his worth. Verse, in verse 1, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord seated on a high throne and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. In other words, his very presence filled up the space in that temple, the, ga the gathering place. And that's nothing less than majesty. Well, what is majesty? Majesty is one of those words that's rather difficult to define, but you know it when you see it, Right? A uh, number of years ago, a man named Jack Hayford wrote a song about it, which has been sung over and over again in many places around the world. The words are majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, power, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own. His anthem raise. Well, Isaiah is also focused on God's holiness. He sees the seraphim. Now, we don't know exactly what seraphim are. They're probably some high rank of angels that surround God's throne. They look like something out of a movie, like aliens, I suppose. We're told that they have six wings, and with two of those wings, they cover their face as a symbol of humility. With two, they cover their feet. Feet are connected, uh, connect us to the earth. Feet get dirty. Feet need to be covered up. With two, they flew showing their readiness to serve the Lord. And so they're singing as they fly back and forth, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, to repeat something three times like this is to elevate it to the superlative, to superlative degree. We're not just told God is holy. <laughs> no, he's holy, holy holy. Let that sink in. No other quality, and the Bible's mentioned three times, no other quality about God. Holiness is God's most fundamental attributes. Holiness means that God's nature is so perfect, so pure, so righteous, that he's completely and absolutely set apart. There is no one like him. Do we focus, do I focus on God's holiness? Well, he also magnifies his power. As they sang back and forth these great words, we're told that the massive temple shook right down to its deepest levels. Can you realize, can you imagine the foundations of this building shaking with the presence of God's, uh, with, the, uh, with the awareness of God's presence here? I'm sure you've had the experience of sitting in your car at a red light. 
And suddenly, as you're sitting there minding your own business, maybe listening to the radio, you hear this deep rumble. And that rumble seems louder and louder. And suddenly you look up, and there beside you is another car that has pulled up. And it has its sound system booming so loudly that your car shakes, and you want to shake along with it. You feel blown away. Imagine on a much bigger level, a higher level, the temple shaking at the voice of one who called out. That's power. Are you impressed with God's power? Does God ever come along and kind of knock you over with his power? Does he ever kind of blow you out of the water? There's a quote in the book, in this chapter we're looking at today, that says, approaching the living God is like gazing in awe at the height of Mount Everest, not wandering into a video arcade. We're talking about real power here. And if we're going to exalt his name together, we have to be more impressed with God than we are with anything else. The Bible speaks of the eyes of our heart, and it's with these eyes that we see God. We need to ask him to open these eyes. We need to sit in his presence and think, and pray, and meditate on this marvelous being we call God. We need to repent and turn away from being more impressed with the creation than we are with the creator. We need to read the scriptures, and about every passage we read, ask ourselves this question, what does this teach me about God? That brings it all down to where it really is. Now, when we magnify God, Something happens to us. We need to watch out. Uh, I think there should really be a warning sign that says, beware of God. I say this because verse 5 says, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. What that's saying is that when you really catch a true glimpse of God, as he really is, as Isaiah did, you start to see yourself as you really are. You start to see things in your heart that maybe didn't bother you all that much before. Isaiah's response is not one of just casually walking away. His response was one of terror. He says he's ruined. I don't know what he meant by that. But he's flat on his face expecting God to lower the boom at any time. He's saying you don't get chummy with God in true worship. The reason is because he and the people around him are people of unclean lips. He's talking about sin here. He's saying that God's holiness is such that in light of his sin, he must die. You see, when we magnify and exalt his name together, we sense our own filthiness, our unworthiness, how offensive we are to him. That's what comes across to us. But when when we see ourselves in the light of his holiness, We don't really want to be that close to God, do we? Really? Doesn't God's presence sometimes make you feel uncomfortable? I don't know if that ever happens to you. It does to me. And really, when you think about it, this is what worship is about. Notice what happens in verses 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The seraphim who praised God also served him as well by taking a burning coal from the altar and pressing those white hot coals on Isaiah's lips the very part of the body that he had confessed as unclean. Now, our unclean lips, well, our lips themselves really are maybe the, the most or one of the most sensitive parts of the body. You burn your lip with hot soup, you know it right away. Lips are sensitive. This was incredibly painful. But at the same time, it was severe mercy Because with the searing of the lips comes the pronouncement here of his forgiveness. He hears the words, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. On what basis can sin be taken away? Well, I think the symbolism here is clear. The burning coals were taken from the altar, which was the place where sacrifice was made for sin. 
And as we know that the sacrifices for sin in the Old Testament were actually looking forward to that one final sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So when the seraphim applied the coal to Isaiah's lips, in reality they were applying the blood of Jesus to his guilty conscience. And Isaiah was forgiven on the very same basis that you and I are forgiven, which is the cross of Jesus Christ. So we gather to exalt God's worth. He is worthy. And when we get a glimpse of him, we're struck down with holy fear. But something is happening here. Something that's totally initiated by God. Because he isn't just a holy God, but a loving God, he touches us. He forgives us through his son, Jesus, the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sins of the world. Nothing, nothing can match an encounter like this because it marks you for life. It happens at that point when you recognize and trust Jesus as your sin bearer. And it happens each time we return to be in his presence and we're reminded that it's only by God's grace that we stand. So not only do we gather to exalt God's worth, we gather to experience God's grace. Let me ask you, do you regularly repent of your sin? I'm asking you, really, as followers of Jesus, do you experience his cleansing every day? You say, well, I do that on Sundays when we have our prayer of confession. No, I'm saying every day, every day. Almost every day, I find myself praying that well-known Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because not a day goes by that I don't sin. Not a day goes by that I don't need him to wash me. Not a day goes by that I don't have every reason to worship the Lord and experience his forgiveness, his grace. Marvelous grace. Amazing grace. A third reason we gather as a body to worship is uh, to be sent out by the Lord. You see, when we experience God's grace in our lives, when we experience his unmerited favor, our lives are never the same. This was a watershed experience in the life of Isaiah. And in verse 8, you see a totally different kind of man than he is in verse 5. Just note, just look at the, those two verses and say, is this the same man? Because in verse 8, he's saying, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Worship is so much more than singing a few songs and listening to a sermons and following a liturgy. Worship is a lifestyle. It's an attitude that says from the heart, here am I, Lord, send me. We need to ponder God's worth. That's true. That's where it starts. But then we need to do something about it. When two people get married, they vow to love, honor, and cherish one another until death. The success of that marriage is, is dependent upon the couple's commitment to that vow. A good marriage isn't determined by a fancy wedding ceremony or the color of the bridesmaids' dresses which seem so important at that time. It's determined by the level of commitment the bride and groom have for each other day after day, year after year. In the same way, the songs we sing, the prayers we pray, the communion we receive, the message we listen to are all just a bunch of pomp and circumstance if we leave without a stronger commitment to serve the Lord. Dr. Billy Graham once said the highest form of worship is unselfish Christian service. Unselfish Christian service. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Romans 12, 1. He said, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And then he puts in this punchline, which I didn't really pay much attention to. I learned the first part of this verse, but here's the punchline in the last part. This is your spiritual act of worship. That's worship. It's presenting all that you are to God in light of his mercy. Right worship leads to right living. It affects the way you live day by day. It affects what you say and how you treat your spouse and your children and the cashier at the grocery store. It'll motivate you to share your faith You'll want to show compassion to those who are in need. You'll want to serve our church by investing your time and energy and spiritual gifts into volunteer ministry. You'll be more ready to forgive those who have wronged you. 
All of this is what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth. Richard Foster said, worship begins in holy expectancy. It ends in holy obedience. And so this morning, as we gather at the communion table to glorify the name and the worth of our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we gather as a body to experience his saving and sustaining grace in our lives through the blood of Jesus that was shed for each of us. But then we also gather to be sent out into a dark and sinful world that desperately, and I say desperately, needs to rub shoulders with living examples of the love of Jesus Christ. The psalmist says it so well in Psalm 34, I will glorify the Lord, let the afflicted hear his voice, glorify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Amen. Let us pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your word of truth. May that word sear our minds and our hearts this morning. And as we gather at the table, may our lives be recognizing the grace and mercy of forgiveness through Jesus Christ with great gratitude and praise. I pray in his name. Amen. We gather at the table of the Lord, and uh, I want to give just a few words of instruction before we do. Uh, I want to say, first of all, that everyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ, who has trusted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, is welcome to this table this morning. Whether you're not, you're a member of this church, we invite you to be part of this act of worship because you're part of the family of God, and this is a family event. Um, I encourage you and will invite you to come down the center aisle. We will observe communion the way we have the last month or two uh, by inviting you to come down the center aisle, pick the bread and then a cup, carry it, and then around the side aisles and back to your seat where you can partake there at your seat. For those of you this morning who are here who, uh, who find it difficult to come forward, we certainly understand that. Please remain in your seat and there will be communion ushers or servers located on the outside aisles who will uh, watch for you and then they'll come to your seat wherever you are and serve you. And so at this time I'll invite the servers to come forward. Please join me in the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, we're told, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave it to his disciples and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For in the same way that you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Gracious God, sanctify these elements that represent you so profoundly today. And may we all feast upon him who is worthy, who alone is worthy, acknowledging our sin, but acknowledging with gratitude the forgiveness and mercy that you've extended to us through the blood of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. I invite you to come now, coming down the center aisle. If you'll start maybe with the front and move forward, we will receive communion at this time.
Thank you, Chris. Amen. Thank you, Kristen and Wayne. Beautiful and meaningful. I invite you to join me as we, lead, as we pray together. Let us remember our nation during this Independence Day celebration and the people that are away or on, on in travel and transit. Uh, we want to remember our nation as well as our church. Let us pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for being citizens of the kingdom of God. We thank you that it is all about Jesus. It's not about all the trappings that sometimes get in the way. We thank you at the same time that we are part of this country where the bells of freedom still ring. We thank you that this is a time to celebrate the independence from tyranny that has been part of our country for so many years. And yet, Lord, at the same time that we celebrate, we recognize that we live 
in days of turmoil, war, bloodshed, fighting, loss of life, not just in faraway places such as Ukraine, but right in our backyards here in Toledo. Our nation, with all of its freedoms, struggles to get out from under its load of sin. We are the United States of America, but we are greatly divided. And it shows up in politics, it shows up in race relations, it shows up morally among families. your reconciliation, that you will show mercy upon us and bring restoration and life. We thank you for our church and how you continually and faithfully meet our needs. But at the same time, we know there are many of us who are burdened with family issues and with physical sickness and issues physically, uh, personal struggles of every kind. Our prayer is that you bring your healing and the reassurance of your presence. May we all turn to you, O oh God, and focus upon you what, on what we need most, and knowing that you faithfully supply our every need. Your promise is, my God, will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We pray today, Lord, for those who are traveling on this busy holiday, for their safety and protection, for those who are on vacation, that you will bring rest and refreshment, including Pastor Clint and his family. We worship you, Lord, for who you are, the Holy One, majestic in power. We thank you that by your Holy Spirit, you dwell within our hearts as we yield to your control and guidance. You are faithful to us. Enable us, we pray, to reflect your faithfulness in our daily walk. We offer our petitions to you, O God, in the name of your Son and our Savior, our coming King, who when he was here on this earth taught us, taught his disciples and taught us that when we pray, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We commit ourselves to the Lord through prayer, through worship through the word, and we also commit ourselves to the Lord through our giving, our tithes and our offerings. If you'd like to leave an offering this morning, there will be a place in the narthex, or you can give online on our secure website if you would like to do that. I have an announcement, a, a kind of a state of the church announcement, or what's coming up soon in our mission world, and that is the work camp that many of you have heard about. We've got 185 or so people coming from all over the country to Maumee. July 17th to 23rd, to work on homes in the Maumee and Toledo area. And as that continues to progress, one of the things that we need the most of, and that's 48, we need 48 ladders to do all the work. <laughs> we, all the painting and repairing that we need to do, you can imagine, uh, we're going to be working on 15 homes with 30 different crews of people, and we need ladders to get that done. The sizes and all that are, in, are listed in the FYI, if you'd like to look at that. If you have ladders that you would like to give us to use for the week. You can contact Phil Christensen, the elder who's over that in the back, or myself. And I, the plan, I think, for the week is that we'll be picking ladders up, or if people can bring them J July 11th that week, then we'll be taking them over to Mommy High School, where people will be housed for the week, and we'll store them there before they go to the work sites. So if you have ladders, let Phil or I know, and we'll figure out how to get them to where they need to be. And with that, I ask you to, to rise if you're able, and we'll sing the final, our final hymn, Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above.
thank you for coming this morning. I hope it's been a blessing to you as your heart has touched, reached out and touched the Lord and he has reached out to touch and change you. About 12 days ago, I had an accident. I fell forward on my face on a concrete parking lot and did some damage to my face, which is healing nicely, by the way, after some stitches. Um, and this morning, I couldn't think of a more appropriate benediction than the one that you're going to hear. This is your blessing for the week. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, power, both now and evermore. Amen. Have a great week. God bless you.